Well, there's no conflict here. It all seems quite uh, cheery, doesn't it? Maybe a little too cheery. In fact, this is what we might call a functionalist definition. Why? Because it assumes that this process of globalization, this thing we call globalization, is uh, the consequence of consensus, of wide agreement, and that in some way, whatever it does, it seems to benefit everybody. Thus, its function. So, uh, not everyone sees globalization as so positive, uh, and many are quite concerned about uh, a variety of consequences of globalization. So, in a certain way, while I think we're going to go with this definition for now, with our working definition, we want to uh, be careful uh, not to see it as the final statement about globalization, because in fact, there's a lot that's going on that is not based on consensus. It has a lot to do with power and politics. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Okay, so uh, empirically, what does globalization look like? So here's a little table giving you some indicators of globalization, comparing 1981 and 1982 on a few variables uh, with 2007 uh, or 2009. So we're going to run through a few of these. So between 82 and 2009, when the world's population increased by 41%, the number of international tourists increased by 233%. Okay? International tourism is way up, which means that people are leaving their home countries and then traveling around the world. So certainly travel is a big part of globalization, exposing ourselves to different cultures in different countries different, different uh, social systems. From 82 to 2007, worldwide investment across national borders, sometimes that's called foreign direct investment. Foreign direct investment increased by 2,507%. I don't think I've ever heard of an increase so big uh, around anything. So a 2,507% increase from 1981 to 82 in foreign direct investment. So what does that tell you? Well, that tells you that people are not just leaving their home countries to vacation, they're also financially leaving their home countries to invest abroad. So international investment now is huge. Uh, the internet barely existed in 1982. In 2006, it comprised 681 million servers connect with people from around the world. And you know how that's done. Email, file transfers, websites, video conferencing, home porno movies, whatever, right? <laughs> so what does that tell you? So that tells you that not just travel, not just money, but communication and information and culture is what's also becoming internationalized. There is this really fascinating website Exactly the name, you might know it. Um, it was called uh, something like Internet Roulette or Chase Roulette or something. What is it? Chat Chat Roulette? Okay, so remind me, I, I haven't done this in a few years. So chatroulette.com, you go on there, your cam lights up, it shows your face, right? And uh, every time you press go, or something like that, or return, a new set of faces, randomly from throughout the world, will pop up. People who are also doing uh, this chat room that. And so there you are, looking into someone's living room, looking at their face, having no idea who they are, what language they speak, whatever. Uh, and. Uh, and there you go. Is it the beginning of a, of a new interaction, a new friend, a new who knows what? Well, that's up to you. But so it's a really fascinating way of linking people randomly uh, across cultures and across the world. Now, not much may come from that particular interaction, but we all know that there are other kinds of interactions on the web that are like that, uh, and that in a sense have shrunk the planet from this gigantic territory of geography where one part of the world in the past would never know anything about the other part of the world. It's 
wrong with all of that to the point where with just a click, all of a sudden you're talking to three dudes in New Zealand, right, who are toasting you with some beer who knows what else uh, on roulette chat. So I think it's pretty cool and it's emblematic of the shrinking of the world and globalization. Okay. Uh, in 1981, about 14,000 international organizations existed, 14,000. By 2007, there were 3.5 times as many. So international organizations. So it's not just individuals moving uh, and, and communicating across the globe. It's not just their money. It's not just travel. Uh, it's also um, organizations, people collectively organizing internationally to do something in the world. Now, one interesting feature of globalization is this, uh, and it's something that you, you find quite a bit in the literature as people are parsing through this dynamic, that as international organizations and international agreements become more common between collectivities, across the globe. What happens to the power of the nation state? Because remember, prior to the time of the internet, uh, let's say a century ago, you know, uh, and, and prior to global travel, the nation state, by and large, contained its citizenry, and the nation state itself, the state, the government, was the most powerful, influential uh, actor. But now, you've got all of these international organizations. You have transnational corporations, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. And so this begs the question, what happens to the power of the state? What happens to the power of a given government when its people are linked up globally to everyone else, but also are able to act collectively in these international organizations that are not necessarily bound by the rules and the laws uh, of a given nation. So in a way, as the world has gotten smaller, the power of the nation state may also be waning with the rise of these collective organizations. Okay. One thing to note, of course, about globalization is the single uh, most important factor driving it is and has always been money. Like, there's a lot of money to be made uh, in global markets. And the way in which the global markets work is itself very fascinating and very political. One of the ways to kind of uh, walk us through that is to think about a sneaker. You think about the sneakers you're wearing right now, or the clothes, or the, or the jewelry, or even the electronics that you're ignoring by lecture right now chatting away with uh, who knows who. So uh, when we look at how a sneaker is created, uh, it is an enormously complex and global process, one that brings together consumers and producers in what we call a global commodity chain. So until about the 1970s, most sneakers in North America were manufactured in the United States. Uh, all of the manufacturing was done there. There were no component parts that you got from India or from China or from uh, Indonesia. Uh, today, we have corporations like Nike that actually produce all of their shoes abroad. Manufacturing plants moved uh, in the 80s and 90s and beyond because governments eliminated many of the laws and regulations uh, and taxes that put a barrier on foreign investment and trade in the past. So there was a great liberalization in all of these uh, uh, state policies that used to contain manufacturing to a given country. So consequently, Nike and many other uh, corporations started setting up overseas plants where they could take advantage of low labor costs. You know the story. But what's resulted ultimately is a new international division of labor. I want you to write that down. A new international division of labor. And in this international division of labor, we're going to talk about it from a few different angles, but what you 
want to start thinking about is this. These are the general patterns. When it comes to uh, management of these corporations, management positions that come with high wages, uh, when it comes to design elements of the speaker you're wearing, uh, or the marketing services, those kinds of services that are related to your speakers are concentrated in the U.S. and other advanced industrial countries. The low-wage part of that speaker, meaning the person that makes the shoelace, the person that makes the Nike whoosh sign, those which are low-paying are generally consigned to developing countries, uh, industrializing countries. So there's a real international division of labor with everything even from just a simple speaker. High wage jobs, more symbolic and complex jobs, are located in advanced uh, first world countries. And the sort of low end manufacturing labor force is located in uh, less developed industrialized countries. So think about the consequences of that. Think about the consequences of that economically, culturally, politically. Now this is not just Nike, but every multinational corporation under the sun, General Motors, General Electric, you can go on and on and on. All of those corporations have closed some, if not all, of their manufacturing plants uh, in Canada, in the US, and other high-wage countries, and instead ship them off to Mexico, Indonesia, and developing countries. So this new international division of labor has yielded quite high profits, as you might imagine, in part because labor is so cheap when it's pushed abroad. So here's an example. Talk about Nike. How many of you are wearing Nike right now? Raise your hand. Come on, that's bullshit. <laughs> Now, now you're just trying to be like a good citizen consumer. You don't really buy that. I see, I see dudes with Nike shirts right in front of my eyes here. All right. All right, how about this? This is a better question. It's the Sleepy Wednesday. Uh, how many of you have ever purchased a Nike product? Okay, if you didn't raise your hand, please keep the group and never come back. Okay, here's some facts about Nike. In the 1990s, Nike spent $5.95, so about six bucks to make a pair of sneakers in Indonesia. Six bucks per, per pair. The workers were paid 14 cents an hour. The shoes were then brought back to the United States and Canada where you paid between $50 and $125. So you paid between $50 and $125 for a pair of speakers that the worker in Indonesia was paid 14 cents an hour. So for the mathematicians out there, how many hours of work would an Indonesian worker at a Nike plant have to work in order to pay for a pair of the speakers that they make in the US or Canada? 14 cents an hour, you've got, to, you've got to find your way to, uh, yeah. let's say, an average of $75 a pair. How many hours would that person have to work? I mean, they'd probably be better off buying a plane ticket here just bugging you. Take your seat on the back. Thank you. 535 hours. So let me put this in slightly different terms. Would you be willing to work 535 hours for a pair of Nike sneakers that you made at 14 cents an hour? You would really be a sucker if you did. So Nike's Indonesian workers were incredibly poorly paid. They were also um, operating in horrendous work conditions. They were often forced to work overtime, sometimes six hours overtime, per day. Six hours, and how much did they get for their overtime? Was six times 14 cents? I don't do that. Okay. <laughs> About 30 or something like that. Imagine working six hours. 
I'm sure most of you have, have had a job, some of you may have jobs now. How would you like if I called you up and said, you know what, you're going to work overtime today for six hours, and I'm going to pay you in total $1.40 for your additional work? I bet you would jump at the chance. Okay, so when the workers try to form a union to protect themselves and to create some change in their working conditions, guess what happened? Union organizers were immediately fired from Nike, and the military was brought in to break up uh, to break up this this, uh, this, this uh, union that was trying to uh, get off the ground. In 1976, Nike manufactured 70 million shoes, uh, and Indonesian workers, as you know, numbered in the 25,000 25,000 workers uh, made under a dollar a day. Okay. Uh, now, here's the other crazy part about globalization. So, you're paying $75 for that sneaker, they're getting paid 14 cents an hour to produce it. The total cost is about $5 for Nike. Then it comes back here. Then, in order to get you to buy the Nike product, Michael Jordan gets hired as a spokesperson. Uh, and guess what Michael Jordan gets paid? You think he gets paid 14 cents an hour? He got $20 million, $20 million for his endorsement of, of Nike sneakers, $20 million. That's more than the combined yearly wages of every single one of those 25,000 Indonesian workers who made the shoes. So this is the crazy thing about global capitalism and globalization. So when you and your friends go out and you buy a pair of Nike sneakers, you realize, of course, that you're inserting yourself into this global commodity chain. Right? You're one of the boxes in that chain. You're the box that makes the whole thing run with your money. So you insert yourself in that uh, global commodity chain. And what is that global commodity chain? It's a set of social and economic relations that connects labor and people or, uh, and consumers around the world. Now, of course, you, the buyer, uh, you don't really create that social relations. Uh, you don't create the social relations that exploit Indonesian labor and put 20 million bucks uh, in Michael Jordan's pockets. But still, it would be difficult to deny that you had some part, however small, uh, in that system, in, in keeping those social relations going. You can have a coffee here with my All right, so I want to talk about the issue of power, uh, power in politics and globalization, an endlessly fascinating uh, topic. But let me first turn to a few other aspects, mechanical issues having to do with globalization. And the first thing is to talk about uh, technology and the economy. Now, one of the major uh, mechanisms of globalization, of course, is technology. Technology is something that allows us to travel across the world, allows us to communicate with others across the world, allows us to transfer money uh, across the world, connects our markets, all of that business. It's also the thing that generates products, and those products themselves are part of that uh, global supply chain that we're talking about. But the truth is, technology alone is not enough to produce the kind of globalization that we have today. Uh, and the reason is this. Because politics themselves can heavily shape how a country responds to globalization. Here's an example. Think about North Korea versus South Korea today. So these are two parts of what used to be the same country, you know that. Uh, but of course, they chose very different paths with very different kinds of political regimes. North Korea and its authoritarian regime are all but blocked off from the rest of the world, and they function with this kind of separatist politics. Uh, here, as in other places like parts of the Middle East, the political will of governments can, in effect, opt out of globalization, or try to opt out of globalization, uh, by closing down their borders, closing it from uh, connection to the internet, 
closing off the globalization of media and culture, movies, certainly North American products like Hollywood, uh, and in some cases even trade. So my point is simply that globalization is not exactly inevitable. It does take political will. And in our day and time, there are certain genes who choose not to partake in Western globalization and to a certain extent have tried to opt out of that uh, globalized system more or less successfully. And as I said before, of course, economics are a powerful generator of globalization, which is one of the reasons why governments find it harder and harder to opt out of globalization. They're sort of increasingly being forced in one way or another because of, of economics, because of international trade and the appeal uh, of that stuff. And once the internet breaks through a country's borders, people are exposed to so many different kinds of lifestyles and material goods uh, and possibilities that it becomes very difficult for the government to sort of uh, keep the, uh, the world, the outside world, out from that point forward. Okay, moving on to uh, transnational corporations. So some say these are the new superpowers, the sort of major uh, acting agents in globalization. What is a transnational corporation? Well, sometimes they're called multinational or international corporations. Um, they're the most important agents of globalization in the world today. They are giant companies that depend increasingly on foreign labor, as we just discussed. They sell their goods and services on world markets. And as I said before, as I alluded to before, they operate with quite a bit of autonomy from the nation state because in a sense they have their foot in one country and the other foot around the world. So it's not really clear under whose jurisdiction multinational corporation falls, who has full control of that uh, organization, or who that organization ultimately is accountable to if not the nation state anymore, then who? So some argue, look, the danger of the transnational corporation is that it's beyond the governance of any given nation. It, it acts above and beyond any national rules uh, or laws or accountability structures. And if it has no single home, then it is, in an essence, accountable to no one but itself, which often reduces to no one but its global shareholders. And what are shareholders most interested in? Are they interested in a local country's environment, education system, infrastructure? No. They're typically interested in their own bank accounts. So this then raises a lot of new questions that your generation will have to figure out and, and the consequences of which you will live with which are how do you gain some sort of uh, control over a multinational corporation? How do you enforce some kind of accountability structure for the things that it does? And it's very, very difficult in part because transnational corporations are everywhere. They exceed the nation state. And sometimes the gross domestic product of a given nation is less than the annual earnings of a transnational corporation. In other words, some nations, their total uh, earnings, their gross, gross, uh, gross domestic product, is actually smaller than the earnings of a corporation. So they're very powerful, they're very wealthy. Uh, they are everywhere and nowhere all at once.
If they have one foot in one country and the other foot sliding around the globe, who are they accountable to? They make hundreds of millions, billions of dollars. They use the infrastructure of a given country, like let's say Indonesia. They use that infrastructure to help manufacture their own goods. But where do, the, where do those revenue dollars go to? Who, who or what uh, receives some of the taxes from the surplus of that revenue? It's a very difficult legal question. In fact, the crazy thing here is this, that many developing countries are actually motivated to provide deep tax incentives to bring over multinational corporations because they want to increase their own tax base and to have some money from a multinational corporation is better than having none. They want to have their citizens work. They want to enter the global supply chain. So they're willing to give uh, one of these mammoth corporations deep tax uh, cuts or incentives in order to lure them over. So not only does the multinational corporation pay pennies to the workers per hour and, and provide often horrible conditions, but they also pay very little in terms of taxes, sometimes much lower than like the small business owner down the block. So where is the justice in that? You guys got to figure that out. Another concern that some have with respect to globalization uh, is this issue of homogenization. Now when you hear homogenization, you probably think butter or milk. Right? Homogenized milk, homogenized cream, you've seen that, right? Uh, but, the other, but, the, but, but the other way in which homogenization is important uh, is in this notion that the entire world slowly but surely is going to look just like the United States. With McDonald's on every corner, uh, and uh, all of the trimmings that come with U.S. culture uh, without any of the kind of global character or flavor. So there's this, this concern among some that globalization, driven mostly by the U.S. and by large first world countries and their kind of multinational corporate uh, associates, that this global culture is going to become more and more reduced to a kind of facsimile of U.S. consumer culture. And that it's going to wipe out everything else. Now Canada has a bit of this too. Uh, Canada, in my opinion, has like a love-hate relationship with the U.S. Uh, on the one hand, I think Canadians love the U.S. Uh, the news is 60% U.S. Uh, so much that goes on here is very similar. In some ways, some would say Toronto is another city of the U.S. Duck from behind. Duck in Um, that's not true, but, but Canada has some protective features. I don't know if you know this, but you know that in Canadian music on the radio station, there's like a certain uh, obligation. You have to play a certain number of Canadian artists. Uh, so Canadian artists receive all of these incentives. The idea being that if you just let the market work its magic, all of Canadian music will be wiped out. Uh, and what you'll basically have is all U.S. radio stations. You may be a little bit on the AM dial, you might be able to get a crunchy Canadian station, right? So Canada knows about this all well, this homogenization thesis. Uh, there is some evidence that this is the case, that homogenization happens. Uh, for example, transnational organizations like the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, these organizations, which you should all know about, are no excuses. They have created economic guidelines and policies for developing countries that come right out of the uh, economic systems of the U.S., meaning they have very similar structures. So the way in which the U.S. manages and structures money and lending has been adopted by the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and has been applied then to uh, abroad to developing countries. Think about in the realm of politics. We have the United Nations, where the US is a powerful but not sole influence. 
The United Nations uh, engages in global governance, 